by the way, many of my colleagues at SFI believe we need a new physics for the origin of life. So it's not ludicrous that you need a new physics for uh, consciousness. I put in the center the Feynman limit, which is what I think of as the limit of an individual human's capacity to comprehend the world in the most fundamental way, fundamental way possible. And I'm going to surround Feynman with cell boxes. And what is that? Well, we, that's culture. Culture is the domain of the non-understood. Uh, and it's full of all of these devices and artifacts that allow someone like Feynman to do his job. Right? If Feynman had to think about, you know, logarithms the way he thinks about entropy, he wouldn't have a job. It's, we are constantly doing this sort of outsourcing to this domain, which is the domain of the partially or not understood. There's two kinds of culture. There's the outsourced culture, which I'm going to call the obligate non-understanding. So when I use, you know, Google Maps, I don't know where I am. I, don't, I have no understanding of what I'm doing. Um, I kind of know how GPS works, but that's not instrumental in my navigating through a novel city. And so that's obligate non-understanding. But there is this very interesting space that I think John was alluding to, which is I'm going to call the domain of generalized automaticity. And this is this world, right, where you have a Federer who can play beautiful tennis, who's not thinking about it, but who can explain what he did when asked, right, as opposed to using a GPS, where I couldn't really tell you. So you do both. It's kind of this magic intermediate zone where you get to do this outsourcing-like thing, but you actually can also reflect on it. The way I've been studying this is by studying these things. Number systems, the abacus, maps, uh, mechanical scientific instruments. I call these, um, it's a little bit building, actually, on the work that David and, and Andy Clark and others did. I call these um, complementary cognitive artifacts, and have been trying to develop a theory for how these kinds of machines work with minds. So during COVID, we all developed weird habits. Mine was Rubik's Cubes. And uh, I started studying the best Rubik's Cubes solvers in the world and trying to understand how this works, both sighted and blindfolded. So there's the Rubik's Cube. That's the standard cube. And, uh, he invented the cube. He's an architect in 1974. 43 quintillion configurations. It's in huge configuration space. It turns out that this cube has something called a God number, which is the maximum number of twists or generators of the group uh, that necessary to be implemented starting from the worst possible initial condition. And you solve it using algorithms. There are on the order of 10,000 algorithms. Good cubers memorize thousands. They're the current world champion, you can give him 65 three by three by three cubes, put them under a blanket, remove the blanket, have him study, and he solves 63 in under an hour, blindfolded. And it's very interesting the algorithms used to solve that task. I'm interested not so much in skill, but expertise. So that's the, that's the Cayley graph. This is a massive structure. When you twist a face, you're basically moving along an edge in this massive graph. The cube is one of the only cases I know of um, a puzzle where the solution to the puzzle is a solution to a mathematical problem that still has no analytical solution. The calculation of the diameter of the graph is actually a very hard problem to solve. There are approximate solutions to this. But actually, when you solve the cube, you're solving a math problem. And you're solving a math problem that mathematicians haven't solved. And because you're solving them in behavior, but it's quite an interesting problem. I don't know if there are other puzzles that are not trivial, that have that, or not interesting, that have that character. When you're solving the cube, that's what you're doing, right? You're, each one of the nodes in this graph is a configuration of the cube, and every edge is a generator that moves you through the graph, and you're trying to move from one point to the point that we describe as solved. So there is, as I said, a God number. There's a God number for any dimensional cube. And there should be a corresponding God time. The number of physical moves is going to correlate with the time. But of course, the time is, a, is messier. The blue line is the solutions to the cube from 2003. That's where tournaments began. And the orange line is time to solve. If you look at the cube, you see these kinds of uh, punctuated equilibria, these episodic periods where the solution is stuck, and, and then it gets unstuck. The unstuck and stuck correspond to the transmission of declarative knowledge in communities of Rube solvers, of Q solvers. Here, try this. This is a collective intelligence task, very interesting one, that you can study all the details of. What I'm plotting here on the left is, is human performance. On the right, computational proof. If you look at 2005 on the right onwards, and humans, we're kind of neck and neck. 
But eventually the God number is analytically discovered for the three by three by three uh, before we discovered it. So no real competitor now would ever solve a cube in more than 20 moves, often less. And that's actually part of the problem for how you make fair competition, right? But what is that blue line? That blue line is these people. That blue line is actually an integration of a collective. I call it the three collective. Every cube has a collective. Um, and on the top is the lifespan, the competitive lifespan of cubers. So you can decompose these cubes not only into how long it took, uh, how many moves it took, but who did it. And how do they do it? They do it by sharing information on fora, which encode recommendations which individuals deposit and that other people extract. You can trace the origin of the invention and the diffusion. Everyone having seen that little trick now adopts it very fast. It's very declarative, but it's not clear who understands. If you solve the cube blindfolded by commutators, these are these moves that only move two pieces and leave the rest of the cube unchanged. It's not clear you really understand how that works, but you definitely acquire the information algorithmically. So it's not an innate thing. It's definitely transmitted through a symbol system and an algorithmic rule system, but very, very few people understand why they work. The consequence of this is something very shocking. Here's the performance over time in terms of the solution times for every cube. And you can do something kind of interesting as you can say, look, they will look rather similar these curves <laughs> and I'm going to rescale them by the diameter of the Cayley graph and they all collapse into one universal exponential. These are not the same problem. The solution algorithms, for example, even in odd cubes are not the same problem. Different algorithms are required to si solve high dimensional cubes and yet they're all following the same universal progress curve. All these cubes turn out to be the same and they're all being solved at the same rate once you do the appropriate uh, rescaling of your axis by the diameter of a very high dimensional mathematical structure. It's, it's quite complicated form of understanding in culture. There's this encoding in individual minds where they have to memorize huge lists of lookup tables. There are communities that share them. There are individuals, many, many times quasi-anonymous, who generate, who invent new algorithms. Where does the understanding live in this system? I think that the, I think that the understanding, I hate to say this, it's so SFI in the worst possible way, but I, but I feel that somehow the understanding lives in the system. I don't know where to put the sort of the, 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 the core causal contributor. I, it feels to me it's kind of in here somewhere, in messy ways. There's a kind of understanding I call the Feynman limit. People seem to find beautifully aesthetic, highly compressed representations of universal regularities that appear in multiple different phenomena. We've also done this thing about outsourcing and a sort of generalized automaticity where we put solutions out into the world, into culture, which we exploit that they don't understand and they don't understand because if they tried to, they would have no time to do any work. The real key to this is a kind of electromagnetic spectrum. There's a kind of core, the, the innermost ore of the onion, which is the thing where we feel most comfortable about talking about understanding, I feel. And then there are these infinite shades of occlusion as we move out into culture whose extreme is large language models. Total opacity by virtue of dimensionality. I think what we need to do is fill out the spectrum and uh, not dichotomize it in rather uninteresting ways. Because of course something like a map is somewhere in between. I think that would be a program I'd be interested in pursuing this how this actually evolved in time and what gets moved over here and what gets pushed over here and why and so forth.